Berkshire to Valley Forge, Berkshire to Valley Forge. How about a word, Lowell? Hey. You talking to me? Did you have a brain tumor for breakfast? Well, then who the hell else are you talking to? Talking to me? I'm no, funny how. I mean, funny. I'm clowning. I'm Peter Vink. We all go a little mad sometimes. Man that doesn't spend time with his family can never be a real man. Yeah. I'm kind of a big deal. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Andy Lowen, welcome to Frame by Frame. Thank you very much, Stephen. It's good to be here in this lush Discord building. Discord. We've just entered the Discord building. We actually had to drag Andy into here. Um, and he, Kicking and screaming. But he couldn't He couldn't go in through the lobby. He had to actually go up the uh, the fire escape and then out of a window. He fell out of the window several times. Yeah. <laughs> I guess he couldn't. He just couldn't it's like the Exorcist where I just threw myself out and went down all those stairs. <laughs> like the stuntman in the Exorcist, he he did it a few times, didn't he? Till he got it right. You got to do it a few times, and 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 it just proved that Andy was not a dummy. No, 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 no. no. And like, like the like the stuntman in the Exorcist, when when you said to me, "How do you not break somewhere?" I just relax. I just let I just let it happen. Let it happen. And, and, yeah, and there is something to that. You know, there's something to that. Yeah. I don't know what that is, but there's something to that. Hello. <laughs> Oh man! So today we're gonna finally talk about silent running. Yes, I'm just looking out for any rogue alien spaceships. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, uh, where did that podcast come from, and who were those people? I don't know, but what was that really nice sort of ambient music, lovely little piano thing, and this uh, and those inspirational quotes. And then some guy ruined it by playing guitar all over it. <laughs> I thought it was perfect. I thought it was, um, yeah, it, just one of those weird things. It came from an alien planet, obviously. It came from. Yeah, it must have been it. I'm very, I'm very dark on the webcam. I do apologize. You're well lit, and I'm kind of like shady McPhee-y. Well, it's because you've got a full head of hair. My this this bald head just radiates. Oh, I know. If, okay. if, if I covered my head, the room would just go dark. There we go. I let the, I let the light up. bounce off my forehead, my giant forehead. We can advertise on this forehead. Look, there you go, Amazon. Oh wow, that was like a metaphor, wasn't it, for something? <laughs> yeah, we're so specific today. This is this is going to be interesting. Space convoy on a strange voyage, carrying a rare cargo. The forests, the plants, the growing things doomed to extinction on Earth. We have just received orders to abandon that nuclear destruct all the forests and return our ships to commercial service. And we're going home! We can't blow up this forest. Meet the almost human drones, amazing companions on a journey beyond the stars. <laughs> the man has a full house and he knew it. Now how about that? Hear Joan Baez sing Rejoice in the Sun and Silent Running. If you continue as is, we figure you'll hit the northeastern quadrant of Saturn's outer ring tomorrow morning. Andy, the clock yes. is running. Tick tock. But, and I'm going to say it again, the clock is silent running. Silent running. You see, yes. You see, that's clever. Never, I never I heard think... you say that before. No, no, it's, you know... Because in space, everything's digital anyway, so... That's it, yeah. And 
it's a silent running clock. We almost to... worked for work the first time we tried doing this before we got interrupted by our past selves, yet future selves that went off with aliens. Allegedly, that's what we heard on the on the, on the podcast. I mean, I, it just sounded like a, like I don't know. Their, their voices went really squeaky, and uh... I wonder if we'll ever hear from them again. <laughs> well, I can tell you, we're not going to have any of that BS in in this stream. This is going to be a simple run of the mill podcast and andy's not going to introduce anything no squirrels no snakes no 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 nothing 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 that would make it difficult for you to edit (laughs) he's devious he's got that look in his eye it's crazy crazy so uh silent running you see yes 1973 no, no, 1972. Sorry, yeah, you're right. 1972. It was the yeah. I got my my facts wrong straight away. It came out March 1972. Um, the Godfather. Um, well, What's Up, Doc? That was another one that came out then. What's Up, Doc? With Barbara Streisand. Barbara Streisand was obviously really popular in the 70s. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, this this came out after Dark Star. Um, I would say it's a little bit more accomplished than Dark Star. Definitely more accomplished, and it's it is more in the vein of two thousand one. Even though Douglas Trumbull made Silent Running as a yet another movie that wanted to counter the experience of of um, two thousand and one, same as Dark yeah. Star. They wanted to be the rebels, and Trumbull wanted to be the humanitarian. Yeah. Um, it's a, a movie about uh, a, a biologist and uh, a, a, a good solid American uh, crew who are, t- are bringing these giant um, uh, ecosystems into space. Biospheres. Biospheres. Yeah. And uh, they're tasked with just basically looking after them, maintaining them. Uh, goofing off just just doing very little and then the company gets bought out by corporation isn't it may say that some of the crew don't take the protection of the um the greenery and the vegetation as seriously as one person on the crew does yep that's very true running over it in those buggies when they're just clearly all bored aren't they they're just in deep space bored yeah but they they're just Messing around, having a good old time. I mean, I, I, th- this is one of those, uh, one of the first movies that had that whole Ridley Scott, Prometheus, all this, all this money, all this technology. They throw stuff out there, and it becomes meaningless trash. Yeah, which is kind of odd. It's a very financially, this seems like a very odd uh, situation for them to have to be up there maintaining these massive structures that they've obviously spent billions building and then they just decided to just destroy it all and one man Lowell will not take it anymore no he will not (laughs) he will not he will go to great lengths welcome to the 70s people (laughs) so where do you start with this film where do you start? Um, I mean, we, we've both watched this multiple times. Not not since doing this podcast, but in our lifetime. It's definitely a, a film that that is so moving and so important that it, it kind of, you know, every time it's on, I just, I just have to sit there and watch it. Yeah, I was going to say that. It's got the Goodfellas thing where whenever Goodfellas is on, I can, I'll watch it. And then whenever Silent Running's on. I'll watch it. You know what I mean? It's that. It's, it's, it's that. It's that good. I guess you know. And it doesn't matter where it is in the film. You can just catch it up and carry on with it. But that's it. it it's it's incredibly watchable, and, and and it's all down to Bruce Stern. I think. I mean, to be one person in that movie for yeah, for seventy percent of the movie. Pretty much on his shoulders, isn't it? The whole film. Yeah. But even when he's with those other characters, they're, they're, they're like mannequins. It's like that he is working with people who have no heart, no soul. Mm. And so it's 
kind of like the, you're, you're, you're with the last person on earth who cares um, and, and it couldn't have been anybody else but Bruce Dern it could not have been anybody else in that role yeah I mean it's like it was made for him yeah he's amazing like like olive oil was made for Popeye uh, um, Shelley Duvall was made for a Popeye. Alan Harrison was about to make. <laughs> yeah, you were because that's just that, it's very relevant because Red Letter Media have just done a done a, um, a discussion of Popeye on their uh, on their thing on their do- uh, dog and pony show. Uh, but yeah, there there are some roles out there you just can't think anybody else. You just can't. I mean, Robert De Niro, Taxi Driver, couldn't have been anybody no. else. No, couldn't have been. Sigourney Weaver. Michael Myers. Halloween. Oh, yeah. Michael Myers. Mike Myers. Halloween. (laughs) Oh, please stand over here while I grab you, grab you and and stab you mercilessly with my knife. (laughs) I don't know why he has to have that accent every time, but he does. Um, What I love about this film, it's got a real B-movie feel to it as well, though. Yeah. Yeah. It's that 70s feel. Obviously, it's an incredibly well-made film and, you know... Some B movie about it, yeah. You know, even uh, the the last one I watched was a 4K restoration of it, which looked incredible. By the way, it looked amazing. Oh yeah, yeah. I I, I think I watched. What do you mean by that? Yeah, yeah, I do, I do. It's it's there is the the visual style of I mean the the cameras. I mean those cameras in the 70s have a special quality to them they capture something unique that you don't see anymore when you watch a film in the 70s you know you're watching a film made then you you everything about it the the yeah. way the acting is the way the, the the way the camera moves everything tells you that this is the author era of i mean this th- this movie was made just under a million dollars wow and it was one of of, of a few movies you know, that includes american graffiti of all of all movies where the uh, studio said okay i think it, it works R- raging bull not raging bull um easy rider was such yeah. a huge success because they just let them go at it it was that whole uh, alter rebellion Send them out there. New wave. This is this is the the real birth of new wave was Easy Rider, and then and then these movies came along. They were given absolute freedom. Final cut. This was a final cut picture for Douglas yeah. Campbell. He had all full control. This is exactly what he wanted, and 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 it is. It's it's a if it's a masterpiece. Trumbull said, and I remember this very clearly. He said, "Well, that came." from 2001. He said, I worked on 2001 for ages. I worked really hard for Stanley Kubrick. And at the end of it, I really wanted to make a film that was about people. Because whatever else 2001 is about, it's not about people. In fact, funnily enough, Silent Running is the yin to 2001's yang. 2001 is all about spaceships, space, emptiness, extraterrestrials, the existential void. It's a film in which there's not much conversation. And what conversation there is, is carried out by people who are deliberately chosen for their facelessness. Silent Running, on the other hand, centers entirely around a wonderful performance by Bruce Dern, who for a lot of the movie is effectively alone on the screen talking to himself or talking to the drones. It is a film about emotions. And it is a film which was made in response to the lack of humanity of 2001. What I find, though, is, like, time hasn't been kind to this film. It doesn't get spoke about as much as it should, which is a real shame, because, like you say, it's a cracking story. There's there's massive spaceships, Mm. cute robots, there's murder. Nothing you want in this film. But it doesn't really get talked about a great deal, does it? When people talk about the all-time classic sci-fi films. And I think when you've got an entity like Star Wars out there that kind of smothers and, and kind of shrouds everything. I mean, in the 70s, this was a very well-regarded film and people loved this movie. People talked about yeah. this movie a lot. As soon as Star Wars came out, that was the only thing that people could talk about. And you could say, um, I mean, there, there were smattering. There, were, there was kind of like a war between Universal and Fox and uh, about about 
who who's stealing from whom and of course George Lucas was fascinated by Douglas Trimble's uh, use of robots and that was yeah. the whole inspiration for R2D2 and they they did argue that R2D2 was a rip off of Huey Dewey and Louie wow wow okay. there is there yeah there's a lot of, a lot of that kind of uh, a lot of suing going on over over the years about different different things being used and even if I put on a limb, he would doing Louie for part two D two. Yeah, there's something yeah, absolutely something incredible about the performances of those amputees. I mean, that there's something yeah. natural about it. I mean, these characters were first of all named, and then they were made into the crew. They were they they were eventually just became crew members instead of just drone one, drone two, drone three. Well, what I was going to say to you is what, what I thought was quite opposite what you said earlier about the crew yeah. being very, um, what did you say? They were mannequins. Like, they were like mannequins. mannequins. Yeah. I was going to say that the drones had more personality than they do. Yes. Uh, and you could argue that because they are only taking orders from Bruce Stern, that they actually are instilling that kind of humanity from him. It's all from him. Yeah. Whereas while the, the 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 crew were alive, they were never ever regarded anything but just drones, just robots. And yeah. uh, so it's kind of it's kind of funny how how artificial intelligence is given that uh, humanity, and it it, it is a very very uh, fast paced evolution for these characters to just suddenly become meaningful even oh and the sad thing is and the weird thing is is every time i watch this i think it is huey dewey and louie but louie actually never gets to to experience that because he gets lost he does yeah there's only two of them uh yeah there's only two uh... from from that moment on from the, the moment of his his breaking away from everything louie um perishes and never ever learns his name and i think that's quite sad that kind of ties in with another sad uh, element of this uh of story which i'll tell you what it gets my heartstrings every time i think about it and of course it, it's all to do with bruce stern's uh real life and right. i mean how much of that was in, injected into this film and how much of that was a discussion between bruce Stern and, and douglas trumbull i don't know but um it's the watering can. Oh, the little... Yeah. That watering can, he brought to the set. Bruce Stone brought that to the set because it was his daughter's watering can. Right. Not Laura Dern's, his famous daughter, but the daughter that he lost uh, to a drowning accident in 1962. Um, I Diane Elizabeth Dern um, died, and she was she was barely two years old. And wow, that's, I had no idea of that. I had no idea. Yeah, and so that watering can was hers. It was she was using it to fill up water when she died. So that suddenly the meaning of all of that becomes so much deeper, especially when he points to the little girl in the photograph. He t he's talking about the little girl who will never be able to touch a leaf. Yeah. That's that's his daughter that he's channeling right there, and you feel it, you know it. This this movie has such a deep level. Yeah. Um, but t to me, I kind of, I mean, it, it happened in 1962, and uh, since then, he, uh, he and Diane had uh, he and elizabeth had um laura during 1967 they oh, she, she never amounts to much she she didn't do much at all no she, but she so she she good. never got to know her bigger sister she never got to know her sister and in 1969 of course uh dern and diane ladd uh, sorry yeah it was diane ladd not not elizabeth diane ladd uh divorced and he got remarried so making this movie he'd already been divorced he already had a second child but he hadn't dealt with the death of diane elizabeth and this right. this movie kind of helped him kind of go through um the, the the final stages of grief or whatever stages of grief there are 
and he he put his grief into this movie. Hundred well, percent. You can see it exactly. Feel it. It's the part that always really just devastates me is when you just see the the, the drone at the end. Just yeah. well, it's there you go. There's the Warren can there, where he's just going about his business, just keeping the garden going mm. That's on it. his own forever. Breaks my heart. Yeah. I can't. I can't take it. I really can't. It because is, I watched it when yeah. I was a kid. I was in floods of tears at that bit. That they just God, I couldn't I mean, handle it. And still to this point now, when I watch it again recently, it just absolutely devastates me. Exactly, and and I mean that's why we feel as though the the movie hasn't been as successful or or as talked about because it it means something. It's not Star Wars where you can just go, hey, you like Star Wars? Yeah, it's surface. It's like, it's like wizards and swords and, and, and dark side, light side, rebellion, fighting. Yay, that's all surface. Surface stuff mm. always rides well um, with, with carryover and, 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 and products. But silent running is, is deep and people don't want to really admit to be able to, to enjoy a film that deep. Well, because of the... You know the invention of box office hits and mm. huge blockbuster films. Which people want to see spectacle or you know or huge things happening all the time. Mm. And you can eat popcorn and you go and you drink your coke and it's great. It's hard. It's hard to eat popcorn and drink coke to this film. Oh yeah, you don't need to eat. You go, you have to be sl- deprived. Do you um, know what I mean? It's yeah. a. It's a, It's yeah. You've got to. Yeah. You've got to, to get through it, <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. It's, a, it's difficult to part. It's not, and, and it's it's a sci fi film. Science fiction is not supposed to have a heart, science fiction is supposed to be always surface. The Roger Corman films of the 80s were all just wooden acting and, and laser beams. But this is a human story, and, and this is you know, Douglas, like I say, Douglas Trumbull wanted to put the humanity into it because he felt as though that was missing from 2001 A Space Odyssey. No matter how amazing it is to look at, 2001 A Space Odyssey has no heart, no soul, and, and the characters are the same as those characters who were the other crew yeah. members. And, um, and it, it is funny because you know. Uh, 2001 has been put in its place quite a few times with these films. And um, yeah. people don't like the big movies to be, you know, given too much credit. You know, these movies, little movies that came out, really knew how to uh, to capture the imagination. Yeah. It's devastating, isn't it? It how, really is. how, are we, how, how are we going to talk about Donald Sutherland after this? <laughs> it's like that'll, that'll be the that'll be the cheery pick me up after this film. <laughs> oh Donald yeah, Sutherland's because we'll there. be celebrating. We'll celebrate his life uh, as you know and what he gave us. But but yeah, Bruce Dern, and and I've got to I've got to give you a connection because when I read about the the daughter and I I learned about that the fact that uh, her mother's name is Diane Ladd and, and her daughter was called Diane in her honour. Um, another famous Diane connecting to David Lynch uh, was played by Laura Dern in uh, the Twin Peaks The Return. Oh! So, as in Diane. Hey, Diane. As in, as in Di- hi, hi, Diane. And, and the fact that that was her, her big sister's name uh, kind of, I kind of thought, oh, that must have resonated, you know. And, and Bruce Dern is still around. He's he's still around. He's very old, but he he would have watched that and appreciated and understood that. And yeah, yeah the the connection is always there. There's always a connection. You, it never goes away, and it should never be forgotten about. That's why, hence, you know, we we are talking about loss here on such a profound level that it needs to be remembered always yeah well, well I had no idea so I really didn't know about that part I found uh, the, the, the print of the watering can as well online the actual, an actual yeah. full size print of that and a part of me wants to make a watering can so much just to uh, I would love to have that watering can as a as a as a thing to pass down yeah 
It might have to be a mug from Fist of Print. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, whatever uh, take homes do you have for this? Well, what, sorry? Any, any other take home thoughts? Things that, that stand out? Anything funny about this movie at all? It's funny when he killed that guy. <laughs> yeah, with the... Yeah. Was it with a shovel? Yeah. So it's like... Um... Oh. It, it reminds me of the player when Tim Robbins kills the, the screenwriter in the water by just pounding him to death. Yeah. And it's like a, it is kind of like an accidental death. It's a it's a it's a death of passion, crime of passion. So he's justified in everything he's done. He's not mad. He's passionate, and he's so passionate that in a world gone wild, which is what, where he is, he does the worst deed of all, which is to take a life to preserve the forest. Is that right? No, it's not right. Should it be done? No, it should not be done. You can't blow up this forest. But it's a movie. <laughs> Once upon a time, the guy had to do it in the movie, so he did it. And then it's up to the audience to judge at the end. Did he overcome the bad that he did? Well, he'll never overcome. You never overcome the ultimate sin, which is to me murder. But he tried to leave something out there that was out there. Yes, he, he has to die at the end because in modern society, you can't get away with murder. And that's the reason that he dies. It's that he doesn't want to be caught, number one, but he doesn't want them to retrieve this dome. So by taking the other dome away, there's one dome that'll always be there forever. And everybody who comes up to me with this movie, including when I did the miniseries Space, that I mean, I had three guys as my technical advisors that walked on the moon. And all they wanted to do was talk about silent running. These guys walked on the moon. And they're asking me, well, what was it like in the geodesic dome? What I said, shit, it was a garage in Canoga Park. I mean, come on, you know, but they were floored by it because it was, it excited them, you know, it excited them. Oh, you know. And it took me a well, long time to know, to figure out how the other guys died because they were in the bios, the biodome that actually got ejected into space and then and they exploded. Yeah, they we kind of, I kind of wanted them to have a, a more glorified death. I wanted them to have a, I wanted Bruce Dern to finish them off as well, but it was enough for him to do it once. It, was, it would become a different film. It would be, it yeah. Be the, uh, it, you know, because what it would have turned into then was sort of a cat and mouse chase where yeah. Bruce Dern's after them and they're trying to hide from them. They would take away yeah. what the film actually is, you exactly. Know. It could have. It, when you think about what it could have been, one person out of passion and yeah. out of just absolute fear of losing this thing he's been spending years looking after. That's it. It's one thing to then go after everybody else turns him into a serial killer. It does. And do you know what? If Douglas Trimble didn't have control over his uh, picture or for final cut, the studio probably would have turned it into that. It probably would have been yeah. a manhunt show, manhunt movie. Because uh, what happens? I mean, he, he he just lives alone. He he hides away from humanity, who thinks he that he's a hero. And so he knows, you know, once they catch up, there's there's no way he's going to be able to return home. There's yeah. no way that he could live with himself. And because he's throughout the film, he's tortured, isn't he? You know this. And, uh, no, there's points of levity. You know when he's having that card game with the yeah with the with the drones. That's that's that that's that's nice. That was that's that that's was cu that was cute. Yeah, yeah. I could I could put well, a dark spin on it and say gambling. <laughs> Gambling's <laughs> not good, people. Um, no, no, but it was a fun little game, and he he just yeah. He, he lost. He, yeah, he did. He had a full house, and he knew it. He had a full house. He knew it. So, yeah. I mean that was, that was quite nice and cute. Um, you feel the weight of it, don't you? You do. You feel yeah. it's it's um, very dense. I think Moon was similar like that. Um, yeah, well, funny enough, I'm going to say to you, they don't really make any films like this. We don't thought, well, actually, they do because Moon was very similar to this. Moon, very similar. Um, 
It's well in sort of feel. Yeah, in yeah. feel. I mean, I mean, imagine Bruce Dern meeting another Bruce Dern clone. Wow, that would be that'd intense. Be a, that'd be a bundle of fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh man! But you know, what? out of all the movies, I don't. I mean, I mean, he was in Nebraska and he, he made a, a few films, but I don't remember anything else other than you know, this is the only Bruce Stern film that I think should exist. It's this this one. I can't think of, of many others where I sat there and thought, wow, yeah, Bruce Stern. Yeah, he's kind of, in later years, he turned into like a sort of angry old um, comedic guy, didn't he? Yeah, and it became funny. Yeah. For it to be mean yeah, spirited. Yeah, up if you're in a dressing gown, angry but funny. That's kind of it. Yeah, it's the bathrobe, uh, angry, angry bathrobe guy. That it, but Larry David yeah. did that so much better um, as the as the angry Jew. Yeah. With uh, with a weird heart, but uh, yeah, Bruce Stern, and of course, he really championed his daughter's uh, career and Diane Ladd's career as well. Uh, what a family the Dern the Dern and Ladd family um, I'm looking at his um, filmography now wasn't there a black and white film he was in um, well he was making movies since the 60s so oh I meant quite modern <laughs> quite modern one um, yeah. he, he did a lot of directing as well did yeah. he do a lot of that? No, he didn't. Um, I don't think. He, I think that's bullshit. I, I think I, I didn't. He didn't do any directing at all. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I seem to remember a film that was quite recent, but um, I remember being. It was like shot in black and white, and it looked like it looked really good. I never got to watch it. It's pro- it probably is prolific. Nebraska. Nebraska. Yeah, he's so prolific. Yeah, Nebraska. That was it. It was very well. Uh, it, it it got a lot of uh, attention. Yeah. The hell is in Django Unchained. Yeah, Nebraska, that's the one. Yeah, the, the, uh, Django Unchained. He's in a yeah, lot of films. He's in films. a film called The Hole. His, his character's Creepy Carl. That's what he ended up being. Creepy, Creepy Carl. Yeah. Uh, he plays a lot of Harrys and, yeah, Harry, Harry. Yeah, but he, he tends to often play uh, supporting oh, roles. Oh, he was in the, the burbs, of course. He was the the Oscar angry burbs. guy in the birds, the bird, the burbs. Yeah, that's where we get him with the bathrobe thing. You know, it's the yeah, bathrobe. That's, that's, where, that's where it was coming from. And of course, down Periscope, Mulholland Falls. He's in so much, but you, like I say, you don't recognize. He was in Monster with uh, Charlize Theron and Christina Ricci, but. Yeah. The astronaut woman. Oh, he did Swamp Devil. Good for him. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, but like, say, this is this is this is the Bruce Dern film, isn't yeah. it? It is. It's his baby, and I think this and, and it, it's such a personal film that uh, I, 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 you, you can't, you just can't go beyond that. You can't make. You know, I, I think what, as soon as he had that, I mean, quite early on in his career as well, if you think about it, how prolific he is, there's there's nothing that's followed it that even comes close, really. It's incredible. Yeah. And I'm thinking just before he lost Very his pro- daughter, he was in like one episode of this, the odd episode of that. 1962 he was in 17 episodes of Stone Burke, whatever that was. Yeah. So, did the Outer Limits, just TV shows. TV shows, 64, Alfred Hitchcock Hour. So his first film I can see here was Hush Your Sweet Charlotte in 64. All TV shows, three episodes, episodes. A lot of episodes. westerns, a lot of westerns. He, But he, he loves to work. Talk about yeah. it. I mean, the, the the credits go on and on. He loves to work, and um... but it feels like even though there's lots of TV series and small films, it's kind of like Silent Running was his his, his one thing, wasn't it? It's, it was, it, his it was thing. the one he could really, really go for, I guess. Yeah. Now, and to use that a decade later as a. And I think we we have a lot 
uh, to thank for the popularity of Silent Running to uh, to Mark Commode, who yeah, he's a massive. He come yeah. he, he made it um, happen. I think either it was the twenty fifth anniversary or the thirtieth anniversary. He got it into the Eden Project. He got it on a big screen in the Eden Project, which was the best place to be able to watch Silent yeah, Running was absolutely. on that huge screen. Now, um, the Valley Lodge, well, not Valley Lodge, the Valley Forge, Valley Lodge is a band. Uh, Valley Forge was um, actually a submarine that they used as a set. And um, originally it was going to be called something else, but they used the actual name of the submarine as the name of the spaceship. That's right. factoid number two. Uh, wow, very good. Cool. Yes. They're actually smashing at you, aren't they? What else, what else can I pull out the magic hat? No, I've, I've, yeah, I, I looked at a lot of trivia points, but um, I think mainly it was, it was all wrapped around his daughter and that watering can. So much of it was wrapped around that. Um, yeah. If you want a little bit of levity, I can tell you there's a slight goof in it. Oh, a goof. Yeah. So you know, at the foot uh, in the finale where he's holding the detonator in his hand. Oh yeah, yeah. It's misspelled as nuclear detonator, as in D-E-T-O-R-N-A-T-O-R. That's very true. That's a good one. There you go. <laughs> what a goof. Oh, they what should a, be ashamed of themselves. They, they, uh, Doug, Doug, what do, you, what do you think you're doing? Obviously, the gremlins got in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've I've got that in there too. Uh, you gotta you gotta have a, a gremlin every so often. Um, so what about the music in this film? The oh, music's beautiful. I haven't even talked about that. I can't believe that. Um, the the music, the score, and Joan Baez, everything. Yeah. Again, it, it ties the emotional chord. It hits the emotional chord perfectly. And it's definitely a song of its time as well. Like you wouldn't yeah, yeah. have that kind of folky song in a major picture now. It's it's a hippie song. It's a very hippie song. It's hippy dippy. It's uh, it tell it tells us exactly when this movie was made. You know, it was just at, just after the '69 yeah. um, flower um, power revolution. So, mm -hmm. but it's such a such a moving song. There's a couple of songs in here that. Um, that work beautifully, and then the rest of it is 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 pounding score, you know. And this film was actually uh, it came out um, as a double feature, uh, as they many of them did in the seventies. And do you know what that other film was that came out? The Andromeda Strain. The Andromeda Strain. Wow. Yeah, both of these films came out at the same time. That was another one of those uh, movies that came out in March, along with The Godfather. And what's up, Doc? Uh, the Andromeda Strain, and yeah. So imagine going to the pictures and seeing both of those films back to back for the first time. What an experience! What a what an amazing. How relevant it is now on a sort of ecological basis. You know the 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 climate crisis that we're suffering at the moment, and to have a film that was done seventy two. Yeah. Would you would you ever see this as a remade film now, a reboot? Would it be a series? It probably would be a series instead, and they'd extend it, and they'd have the you know the, the fallout of what happened. Excuse the the word fallout because that's happening with um, yeah. Series. It could be. It probably would be a backstory of how it came to be. Yeah, and why the, all the biospheres are there out in space. Yeah. Because are they, are they out there on the on the understanding that they may have to go back? They'll keep this vegetation on when the planet is at a point where it might be able to sustain vegetation again. They go back. That's it. I thought they were trying to kind of figure out the uh, to fix the ecological problem, the climate problem, artificially, naturally. They were gonna, yeah. but then they decided, no, nobody actually really cares. And that was the whole thing. It's that easy to just yeah. have a, a, a multi-trillion dollar thing and, and then suddenly go, oh, I don't care. It's the meteorologist in Prometheus. 
yeah. it, it, being hired to do one job and actually not caring at all. Yeah. Um, being scared of everything until a weird alien snake comes out of the yeah. goo. And I'm not scared of that. No, not at all. Uh, but I am, yeah. I am scared of, of a planet of, of people who don't care about the, the, the ecological uh, future. I mean, Al Gore. I mean, it's very relevant yeah. now. Uh, you know, industry and huge companies destroying the planet and yeah. they're doing whatever they can to hide the facts of what they're doing. Exactly. I mean, Al, Al Gore had it. Water, you know. He had the uh, the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for uh, for um, for that documentary that he made about the climate change and all of that. Yeah. And in his peak, he kind of spearheaded a lot of change. Yeah. Everybody started to recycle, 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 and then all of a sudden, there's the there's the big lie of recycling, in that it only they only take so much recycling before they have to dump the rest, on on another poor country's uh, shore shoreline. Yeah. So again, it's kind of like you they, uh, humanity can only go so far before it decides to go no. We're going to burn fossil well, fuels. All the interests will get what they want because they're the powers that be, and they got interested yeah. in preserving the planet. They just want to have power, and more for them, less for us. And mm. that's why it's so heartbreaking at this film, where it was like, right, you know, destroy them. Don't need them now. And that's why it's, and that's why people can't watch this. That's why people don't shout about this. That this is actually, I mean, a better film than Star Wars, uh, in yeah. that it tells you more about humanity than Star Wars ever could. Hmm. You know, and well, there's wow. lasers in Star Wars. Yeah, there, there are lasers in uh, Silent Running. You just can't see them because yeah. because lasers you can't see. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> can't see lasers. That's the whole idea of them. Yeah, to actually have a light emitting from a laser would actually cost more, uh, and, and in in battery power. Yeah. So why? Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, the 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 time of this, and of course, uh, all the all the miniatures and everything, and of course, by the eighties, people were kind of like uh, delving into classic films that uh, they never expected to be able to, to remember they actually did use the Valley Forge um, as a part of the Battlestar Galactica fleet in the series Battlestar Galactica back in the 80s oh. they, they, yeah, because they just a lot of the 80s movies these sci-fi films they, they stole from Silent Running and they, they wouldn't steal from Kubrick because it's too obvious um, but they yeah. stole from everything that was happening in the 70s because they didn't expect people to actually see these film, films again. You weren't supposed to have it in your home or to be able to... You, you could only watch it on the cinematic screen and then go home. Yeah. So I think Silent Running had a bit of a disadvantage as well being in the early 70s because of that fact. You know, it wouldn't have been seen on TV until the 80s and wouldn't be on home video until the 90s. Yeah, and by that time, like you said, Star Wars and all that is the whole world and people yeah. are not interested in seeing this slow-paced drama set in space. Yeah, and it's not even slow-paced. It's, it's, uh, yeah, a lot happens in 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 that runtime. A lot happens, and it's. I suppose, I suppose I mean in context to a Star Wars film. In context, yeah, yeah. Although, you know I mean? although the prequels kind of the prequels battles. kind of became dr drama only until the last third third act. Well, yeah. but, uh, so it, it's amazing how, yeah, people can't handle this. They can't handle silent running, but they need no. to. They they need to just just get out there, grab a copy, um, listen to the commentary, learn about it, and watch the documentary with Trumbull about how he made it because it was it's all model mil, mil, all models it's all it's all polystyrene and plastic and you know Trumbull's dad it's actually Trumbull's made... famous for what he did on Close Encounters of the Third Kind isn't it exactly he did a lot of the exactly effects, yeah. especially effects on that and of course Dark Star and, and Silent Running 
became those pioneer movies where all the technology that they started to use, the CGI, the, 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 the green screen process, the, the model making, their careers, uh, people, you know, people like George Lucas and Spielberg came to them. They came to yeah. uh, John Carpenter and, and Trumbull and, and, and to say, how did you do it? You know? Yeah. So uh, without Silent Running, there would be no Star Wars. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's simple the thing, as that. isn't it, Paul? Like Goldblum says in um, Jurassic Park, they just stand on the shoulders of geniuses. And yes. before you know it, you know, they put it on a lunchbox, they package it, they send it out. and Yeah. And, and ironically, you know I mean? ironically, Jurassic Park probably had a lot of lunchboxes. <laughs> yeah. It's like... Uh, I bet you Jeff Goldblum got given a, a, a Jurassic Park lunchbox, and he and he was and he was proud of it. Yeah, so, well, that's also kind of self aware that film was because obviously, in the in the actual Jurassic Park, there was a gift shop where you could buy you could buy it, but also in real life, yeah, the Jurassic Park lunchbox because so people love the film and it's Spaceballs the movie. It's a yeah, it's yeah. shoulders of geniuses. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Spaceballs. Make it before, watch it before they make a sequel. <laughs> we talk about space balls. Thanks. We should do it. Space balls. Yeah. It'd be I, nice comparison piece to Silent Running. It is kind of funny because you know, I, I never think that Silent Running would be would be so sad watching it again. And, and of course, last the, the, the night I watched it, I thought, well, this is going to be a heavy one. But you know well, what? When we thought about talking about it, I was actually like, oh, right, okay watch it again but every time i watch it it absolutely devastates me it really yeah. does it really really affects me it's just the image of just the i can't which one does he leave is it huey or dewey or oh huey or dewey one of those two i think uh, yeah huey, huey gets hit well, which, i think it's dewey yeah because one one has to go back go with him yeah and he says to it because you have to come home with me because you don't work and you have to leave huey and he's just just that image. Well, now I know it's even more poignant. It's breaking my heart about the watering can, but just the image of it just being on its own there. I know it's just a robot, but it's not. No. And it just leaves it. And it's just the fact that it's out there forever, just trying to just recycle it, just doing this thing it's on still its out own. There. It's, it's kind of like, you know what stole them from that idea, don't you? Wally. <laughs> Well, he's just on that, and again, Wally has the same environmental message that Silent Running does. Mm -hmm. It's a cute robot. Also, okay, it looks a little bit more like Short Circuit, but it's still a cute robot that's just doing its same job on its own over and over and over again. It's as if the robot had a Silent Running, made it back to Earth. Earth's a wasteland now, so it just keeps on trying to fix Earth. So it could be connected. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds incredible. Yeah, but I think the idea of him that 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 uh, whole I mean I mean the the lights would have run out of, of battery eventually, right? What's... It would have done because they weren't close enough to any kind of star to, to if it was any star kind of solar panel right? technology. They're not close enough to any kind of star to harness its energy, are they? It would have been just out yeah, beyond beyond our solar system and into the, the depths of darkness and uh unless Dewey being the the mechanical genius that he was, would find a re uh, discover a renew renewable source of energy that would keep him going. The scene with Dewey at the end of the movie, when I put my hands on him and tell him how it's up to him to maintain the forest, because I'm not going to be here anymore, and he's got to take it forever. Take care of yourself, Dewey. He'll go on forever because his batteries won't ever run down. So he's going to be there forever. People always come up to me and they say, from my daughter Laura on, that's the first scene she ever remembers seeing me in where she was really touched by it. She just was absolutely affected by it. His wife's silent running is Wally for grown ups. Ah. The two environmental space movies have a lot in common, but only one of them comes with a truly happy ending. In the discourse of deciding the best space movies of all time, there are some pretty bizarre concepts and plot lines that make the cut, but the very real topic of man-made climate change has only made its way into a small handful of movies. Might be worth. It's like just a piece comparing both of them. Yeah. Opt optimism versus cynicism. I know which is which. 
Is space the key to climate change? Eh, I'll send I'll send you the link. Definitely. I mean, I mean that the the message of silent running is is futility and desperation. Mm. It's it's basically trying to get a bucket to empty an ocean. And constantly yeah. just go trying to tip the water away. It's just it's just never gonna you're never gonna win. But I don't know, what was the ending of Wally? Was that a positive ending? It's a positive ending where um mm. because of this little robot, they it, it it's all the I've never seen it. It's like so everyone on the ship, they're all huge fat. They don't do anything. The machines That's do it. everything for them. I remember that part. And yeah. they're on this big yeah, they're on this big spaceship in uh, until the world's habitable again and then they come back, but the mm. the the big master mind on the spaceship, the the you know, the the, the AI on the space doesn't want them to go back because then they're irrelevant. Got you. Yeah. Um, so it lies to them and it tries to keep themselves wholly reliant on them. Uh, but the, I think um, the small little white robot that comes down is just like a drone to take stock and a little bit of vegetation. Just one little plant grows. And I think Wally sees it and it turns into this whole thing then. That's know? it. Yeah. It's an amazing film. Incredible film. There is another one that is about, uh, about climate change and ec- ecology, and that was the Lorax. Which became oh yeah yeah, yeah. which is uh, you know the, the whole I mean that was a very ham fisted um, sorry yeah. gr- green eggs and ham fisted uh, story um, which yeah again it it always comes down to that happy ending of of you know everybody decides to pull together and, and grow a tree the first tree that anybody's yeah. seen ever and and it's like well yeah it's all nice and cute but. You know, it's ne- it's not always that easy. You can't just come out of the cinema and say, "Wow, that it, it is possible," but you've got to know that it it takes a lot more hard work because, unfortunately, the reality is is that uh, the corporation is still out there, mm. and it's 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 always going to be a fight against that corporation. Yeah. Although at well, the moment, even now, you know, we don't really yeah. want to talk about it, but the sort of thing that's happening at the minute, you know, it looks like. You know, Tories of in our country are pretty much, you know, they've ignored this kind of thing in the to, to more line the pockets of the business interests that. That's it. You know, work. They're not interested in growing but, trees. No, but even Labour, they've got this thing now. They kind of call it the Great GB Energy. But they're very careful of what they say about it because they know if they say too much, what they want to do, or they say right, it's going to be this, this, and this, and we're going to put all the energy back in the hands of the private sector. Well, all big businesses go, right, we'll, we'll leave them. You, you don't get our money anymore. That's it. It's- it is. It, and it's, it's all about what's not said and what's not done and what's hidden away. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's the whole humanity is terrible and, and you know, what, you know what, are, what, are we, what are we going to be able to do? And that's why we always get these stories told to us in in movie theaters it's always this this underdog it's always the underdog who is you me everybody else who manages to to win and grow that tree and and has a happy ending and creates that happy ending it's it's all fairy tale oh like silent (laughs) running you can't say that it has a happy ending can you no it doesn't but 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 it's just to the slap, isn't it? It, it, yeah him blowing himself up is kind of cathartic for him yeah he, he gets, might have stung a little bit ending. yeah it is and it is an end he gets what yeah, he wants I, he gets what he wants or well, maybe well not more more so he he prevents them from getting what they want so, and uh, in, yeah. in a way nobody wins yeah, well, he must know in the end, though, because uh, from what we discussed, that it, there's no way these plants will survive. Yeah, but at least they didn't die now. Yeah. And it's not... And he can die in the knowledge, knowing that... That, that he, he didn't kill them. Yeah. Yeah. 
Wow. Oh, it's an every film, this one, mate. It is everything. It's everything in this film. So much. I can't play the role that I played in Black Sunday again for a while. I find it odd that people think that role is like the one you play in Coming Home, oh, and I hear not. you do too. Yeah. But the, to me, they're, they're, they're important differences. And, well, uh, uh, they're very different. So because one, you yell it. Because I pick up a gun, that's the thing. Yeah, they remember, I pick up a gun and point it at a woman, which I just did 10 months ago, and they remember that. You that's know? right. That invites and uh, they think that it's the same pattern going on, and it's the same guy, and that's all he is, and here he goes again during doing his thing. And they're a little bored with that, you know. Yeah. But the point is that it's, it's, I would like to change, I would have loved to play John Voight's part, but they didn't offer it to me, you know. And you get to a point where you say, okay, what did I begin for in the beginning? Did I begin to just be a, a, a superstar or a movie star, or did I begin to try and become an artist as an actor? And that's what I began for. I, I got it, I became an actor because of, I wanted to be a communicator. I wanted to touch people. I wanted to reach out to people. I wanted people to understand me mm -hmm. and understand the characters that I played. So shall we wrap it up and go on to uh, uh, have a little bit of a tribute? Uh, how, are we doing yeah. with, how are we doing for time? <laughs> I've probably got about 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Donald. You went looking for it. God is not responsible for the life you choose. I did not choose it. A talented son trying to live up to the high standards of a powerful father. That's part of the plot of Forsaken, but it's also reality for Kiefer Sutherland, whose father, Donald, has been a star for more than the last half century. You know, I'm going to embarrass him right now. I have always felt that uh, not only is my father one of the most prolific actors in the English language, he is also one of the most important. And he's someone that I wanted to work with uh, for my whole career. Is it true that you didn't even realize your dad was an actor until you were 18? Well, no, I always knew he was an actor, um, but I didn't know... You just the, thought I told jokes. No, I didn't know the scope of, of, of what he had done. MASH, Clute, Ordinary People, Eye of the Needle, I mean, the list is endless. So what kind of advice, you being who you are, and now your son is getting into the business, what kind of advice do you offer, to, or did you just step back and let him do his thing? I didn't give you any advice, did I? I said be truthful. You said be truthful. Yeah, that's And it. the way I took that was don't get caught forcing a moment. <laughs> even even if it means, even if in the script it says, you know, and, and the man works himself to tears. If the script or you're not getting to those tears, figure out another way to play it. And of course, like any son, I didn't really listen that well. For me, with, with, uh, with Donald Sutherland, it's the early 70s movies that I that resonate the most with me. And yeah, I, I, I think Did you know, he started his career in horror films. Yeah. Castle of the Living Dead, Fanatic, Dr. Terror, yeah. the House of Horror. Yeah. I mean, he was very much. Um, and of course, war films, you know, were his yeah, it's other bread and butter. Was it? Yeah. Exactly. In MASH. But oh, MASH, right. Kelly's yeah. Heroes and, 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 and of the like. Uh, but for me, I yeah, mean, it all starts with Don't Look Now and, and Invasion of the Body Snatchers are, are my two favorite movies of all time. They're in the top 10 list of all fa of my yeah. all time favorites. We've talked about Invasion of the Body Snatchers quite extensively. That was a fun yeah. romp. Yeah. Don't Look Now is again, is probably one of my favorite films also about the death of a daughter drowning. She drowned. <laughs> this is a heavy episode it it, uh, so, so Bruce Dern and Donald Sutherland have this, this incredible link with this movie and of course it was made uh, after um, after uh, Bruce Dern made uh, uh, Silent Running but of course Sylvia, yeah. the, Sylvia Plath's book was probably before um, so don't look it's now it's one year later it's only a year later yeah just one year oh. So, I mean, the, the guy he's just gone through promoting Silent Running, go on, go on, uh, pr go on, uh, see this movie. Go and see Don't Look Now. <laughs> oh, that must have been heartbreaking again. Imagine, like, Bruce Stern, he just made that film, in, like, the year later, and he's, like, still for the way, you know what, there's this new Donald Sutherland horror film come yeah. out. Should we go watch that? Yeah, yeah. let's watch that. That'll cheer us up. 
And of course, again, there is the uh, the iconic ball in Don't Look Now, the, the, the child's ball. She had a ball before she drowned. So I wonder how much of that was kind of taken from the idea of the watering can and the, the memory of her. So, yeah, it's it's a heavy, it's a, another heavy one, but it's one of my favorites because it's so beautiful and, and, it, and it pictures Venice in such an, an incredible way. Um, well, I listened to a podcast called uh, Films to be Buried With. I discussed it with you before. And um, the 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 guy of that who runs that, it's his favorite film of all time. Yeah, I don't know. It was our number yeah. one for the horror 30, uh, 31 days of horror. It was, it was our, yeah. that last one. We'd probably do a deep dive into that, couldn't we? We could do a deep dive. Um, there, there's a lot not, of layers. Not, a lot of layers. Really. Yeah, yeah. It's not definitely right now. <laughs> um, but everybody, everybody wants to remember him. I think uh, for. Um, for doing the uh, the Hunger Games. Well, he played a really good bastard, didn't he? Yeah, the president. Yeah, but I mean, not just that film, but Donald Sutherland was great at playing a bastard. Like, oh. Have you ever seen Lock Up? He did with um, Sylvester Stallone. So S- Stallone plays this guy. You know, oh. when, he's trying, when he keeps trying to act? Yeah. And uh, he did one where he was in, he was in prison unfairly. Yeah, I do remember that. And uh, Donald Sutherland's the jail guard and he sort of doesn't take him and he's like awful he's like an evil bastard in it you know it's very and good he was really good at playing that really evil guy you know this wouldn't be official without witnesses nothing he's trying to get me to take responsibility for his escape attempt just like before i don't want to confess you set me up you set everything up i don't know what you're talking about killing of the kid guilty on all counts prove it Prove it, Frank. That's your problem. You can't prove anything. No! No! Don't do it, Leone. I confess. I confess, Mr. Meisner. Everything that he said was true. I set him up. Everything. No one has first. Please. Don't kill me. That's it. And he he did the same. He played um, uh, in Backdraft. He played a really I sinister, evil character who was who was who was um, what what do you call somebody? A pyromaniac. He was a pyromaniac who yeah. put away, and the cycle psycho, psychological understanding and the underpinnings of of why he does what he does. He just likes yeah. things to burn, burn. What do you do to old ladies, Wendell? <laughs> What about the world, Ronald? What would you like to do to the whole world? Burn it all. (laughs) See you next year. And he really, really liked that role, I could tell. I mean, he did come back for the sequel, bless him, um, in recent years, but what a... Yeah, I, I I love his the small roles that he did in the '90s were kind of some of my favorite favorite characters. JFK. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was JFK. Yeah, he he did that monologue in JFK. I learned that monologue uh, for um, my solo acting exam because I just wow. loved the way he delivered it. And it was just it was n- no different to Robin Williams sitting on the bench in Goodwill Hunting. That kind of a, a monologue. It was definitely a sit, a sit and talk monologue. That's probably why I'm yeah. so good at talking. <laughs> but he was in. Um, do you ever watch the uh, the film version of Buffy the Vampire Slayer? Yeah, he he was Merrick Jameson Smythe. Oh. Yeah, he was in that, which is a, just a. I like that film. It's a fun little film. Yeah, written by Joss Whedon, of course. He was in Outbreak, so he played the bastard in Outbreak. Outbreak, yes, he was again playing the evil son of a bitch, and of course. Uh, he was in a time to kill time with to his kill, yeah, with his son Kifa, who played a bastard in that movie, an evil, yeah. racist. Uh, you know, Kiefer is good at playing the bad guy as well. I mean, he got a lot of, uh, you know, he's able to do both. You can be a likable yeah. and an unlikable character in in, in both instances. Um, 
So yeah, well, and, yeah uh, he did great, man. He was a absolute. But yeah, it's the seventies stuff that. Yes. For me, it's, it's, it's peak Donald Sutherland. Peak Donald Sutherland, yeah. And uh, oh, oh, he was in American Haunting as well. I don't know if you remember seeing that one. The, I do, yeah. Yeah, the, he played John, John Bell. So that was, yeah. And, and, uh, and I, I got to say, yeah, he, um, oh, Ed As, Ad Astra, sorry, of a space film. Um, where he, he did a, a tremendous job. But he always, I mean, uh, he always does a tremendous job, no matter what, how big or small the role is, or how evil or how nice his character. Yeah. And he will be sorely missed. He certainly will. But well, we're lucky we get to relive the great films he did. So, yeah, R.I.P. Donald. Rest in peace, sir. I was born in New Brunswick, in St. John. I'm a blue noser, I guess. I'm just a, you know, an okay actor. Then why the hell aren't you up there helping him? Oh, man. I only ride him. I don't know what makes him work. The first play I ever did was here in Toronto. You know, I came here because I told my dad I wanted to be an actor. I knew that it was what I wanted to be. I don't know your name, stranger, but your face is familiar. If you are skilled, you can be a poet. Uh, you can do something very valuable. You, you really do love him, don't you? In their lives, it's, it's, it's like a love affair. It's extraordinary. It's really beautiful. It's thrilling. And you take it home and you can taste it. May the odds be ever in your favor. No, there, no, there's, uh, making films is, is, is terrific. Why don't you knock it off with them negative waves? You start out in this life and you have a modicum of talent. You have a certain amount of luck. You have discipline and hard work. But the essential thing is to have a wonderful partner. And then, then if you have that, you, um, you have a chance of having a life. It's worthwhile. Hope. It is the only thing stronger than fear. So, Andy, are you ready to wrap up? Yeah. Well, you've been Andy Lewin okay. and I've been Stephen. And... Andy Lewin. Absolutely. Thanks again, man. Love it. Really good. All right. Take care, dude. Bye, Zee. Bye. Good luck, mate. Bye. I feel the need. The need for speed. This is fantasy. Oh, you betcha, yeah. Quit griping. I like griping. <laughs> I got a bad feeling about this. Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it.